Greetings, my name is Sharon Norton, and I'm from Mennonite Mission Network, and we are sharing this recording with you today with four guest speakers from around the world who will share stories about how they face different challenges in these very difficult times. Not only did we have the COVID pandemic, which affect all of us around the world, but there were many countries that face special challenges, war in Ukraine, poverty, lack of access to internet and infrastructure and on and on. So we wanna share some stories from our friends and from our partners who will hopefully inspire you in your own collaboration and networking. First, we'll have John Fumana of African Inter Mennonite Mission. He will share about how COVID affected Mennonites in the Democratic Republic of Congo and what it has meant for them when they were able to get some substantial help to build infrastructure for IT so that they could participate in multinational meetings and conferences and different things, different ministries of the church. And you'll hear him talk about how the global Anabaptist family has become like a small village because of this. Following that, we'll have the president of the Odessa Theological Seminary in Ukraine talking about what it's meant on top of COVID to also have war break out in their country and how they've had to adjust and adapt as a seminary. And so we'll hear him talk about the body of Christ and examples and stories of ways that the body of Christ has stood in unity and in solidarity, and also sadly some ways where it has not. And he will leave us with, with a strong challenge and a request. Next will be Robin Gingrich from LCC International University in Lithuania. She will share about not just the COVID response, but also the war in Ukraine. But even before the war in Ukraine and how it affected their Ukrainian students, there was the, the resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan and how the Afghani students um, responded and needed special support um, since then. So she'll share about that and also leave us with a request. Fernando Perez and Rebecca Gonzalez will be our, our final panelist sharing about the work with the Comunidad de Instituciones Teológicas Anabautistas, or CITA. They'll be coming to us from Mexico and they'll share about how COVID pushed them to move forward the timeline to work on virtual platforms so that more people would have access to the theological programs and how they went far beyond even the theological academic programs to provide support and encouragement um, during these isolating times of separation because of COVID. So we, we thank you for watching. We hope each one of you will take something away that will make a difference in your own context. Thank you, Sharon, for providing this opportunity to talk a bit about uh, how people uh, have survived during COVID time and to see uh, the momentum of resilience that uh, we have seen here in the DRC. Mm -hmm. um, let me first um, say that uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has one of the largest membership and we have uh, three uh, denominations in the Congo, the Mennonite Brethren Church of the Congo, which I'm going to talk about. And there is the Mennonite Evangelical Church and the Mennonite Church. Mm -hmm. um, the Mennonite Brethren Church of the Congo has its headquarters in Kikwit. Kikwit is the largest city of the former Bandundu province. It used to be a Bandundu province that is now divided into three provinces, mm -hmm. uh, one of which is Quilu. And the Kikwit is the largest city of uh, the Quilu province. It used to be the largest city of the Bandundu province. It is located 525 kilometers from Kinshasa, the mm -hmm. capital city of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine uh, the number of Mennonite Christians who live in that area. Kikwit, and not only in Kikwit, but in their surrounding uh, areas, uh, villages, and smaller cities, so in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kikwit is on the main road to Kinshasa. Okay. So people who take the road like from the Kasai provinces mm -hmm. go through Kikwit to come 
to Kinshasa. And it is also a business city, mm-hmm. like uh, uh, a center where people have to stop by before they go south of the, the, the country to the Angolan border, to the Kasai provinces, and mm-hmm. some other parts of the Bandundu province. Mm-hmm. And uh, with the infrastructure, the limited infrastructure that you have in Kikwit, sometimes people have to travel to Kinshasa to do things mm-hmm. because of the limited facilities and infrastructure, because of uh, the lack of good uh, power system, electricity system. And that causes a huge challenge to do some of the things in Kikwit. And when we talk about COVID, we admit that it had devastating consequences, not only on Kibbutz, but on the whole country. Yeah, and so you wanted to respond to that. And um, we were talking about many different challenges and different things. And uh, Mission Network was able to get uh, a grant from the Showalter Foundation um, to work with infrastructure issues, especially related to to technology and the internet. And could you describe um, what that grant has done, what what project uh, we have been able to start together in Kikwit? Uh, Let me say first something. Uh, That same, the year after that, I think, is when we were appointed to office with AIMM. And I remember uh, the IMM International Central Committee had a meeting, an online meeting, with the, the, the internet connection and the electricity in Bujimai, Kekwit, mm-hmm. and uh, um, what is it, Chikapa, it was not possible. So right. the leaders of the churches of the Congo had to travel to mm-hmm. Kinshasa, mm-hmm. stay in a guest house, Mm-hmm. have good access to internet and attend the meeting. Right. So can you imagine what kind of support Mennonite M- M- Mission Network is bringing when they decide to support building the capacity of inter- to internet access for the Mennonite Burden Church in Kikwit? Mm-hmm. This is a very, very good support. And I bless God for that. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine how it is going to help the Mennonite Brethren Church of of Congo in Kikwit, but not only the Mennonite Brethren Church of Congo, there is another uh, uh, Mennonite church in Kikwit, the SEMCO, Mm -hmm. that has a provincial headquarters in Kikwit. So this uh, provides access to communication from Kikwit rather than having to move to Kinshasa. This is very, very good. And uh, the project or this offer was very well welcomed uh, from the Mennonite Brethren Church uh, leaders in Kikwit. Mm-hmm. They really enjoyed it. They really appreciated it. And I, 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 I remember the day I was telling them that we have funds to support them build their capacity. Their reaction was like, wow, this is very good. And we, 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 we want it. We really want it. Yeah, yeah. And so, so one of the um, impacts that, that this is going to have is that um, folks in Kikwit and anyone who can get to Kikwit can also participate in Mennonite World Conference online this year. Exactly. And, yeah, like the number of exactly. people that can participate is above and beyond anything that that could have happened yeah. without this. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, even if uh, people had to travel without having any restrictions, not mm-hmm. everybody would be able to make it to Indonesia. Right. Um, economics, uh, visas, mm-hmm. uh, COVID restrictions, mm-hmm. uh, the number of delegates. But right. uh, this offers an opportunity for more people to be able to attend the Mennonite World Conference gathering, the assembly uh, to be held in uh, July in Indonesia from Cape without having to, to travel. Yeah. So some people who have heard about this Mennonite World Conference gathering without knowing how it happens, what happens during the, those times, mm-hmm. these times, will be able to attend it from Cape And this will be a first time. Mm-hmm. It, this is kind of an innovation 
Mm -hmm. There's something that the people in Kikwit have never seen. Mm -hmm. So some of them will be able to go into a room at the Mennonite Berlin Church office in Kikwit and be able to attend. This wow. is amazing. They will be able to join the, the other members of the, the, the global Anabaptist family, worship, share their faith, sing, praise, mm -hmm. and pray. This is very good. This will be a very good reunion. I usually say that uh, when we meet together, coming from different parts of the world with, uh, the, in, uh, within the Anabaptist family, I usually say this is a, fort, uh, uh, a foretaste of what will happen in heaven when mm. we see people from all the nations coming together and worship the Lamb. So this mm -hmm. time, the people in Kikwit will have an opportunity to live it. Oh, that's so say, exciting. Life. Getting goosebumps yeah. as you talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is. It's a wonderful opportunity. I'm so glad that we could collaborate in this way together. And so I just mm -hmm. want to give greetings also to all those in Kikwit who, yeah. who are watching this video and who are participating in the Mennonite World Conference. We stand with you and mm -hmm. we're grateful for the generosity also of the Showalter Foundation. I'm just struck by right. how collaboration yeah. works. Yeah. You know, it's we have a resource here. We have a relationship mm -hmm. with you. You have a relationship with churches in the Congo and, mm -hmm. you know, all of these different pieces kind of fitting together. And it's all for the, the glory of God and for the work of the reign of God. So praise be to the Lord for, for this opportunity. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And this is a sign of resilience during this time of COVID. You, can you imagine how people have been able to uh, show creativity? At this time, we cannot move together. We cannot gather. We cannot meet face to face. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is okay. this is really amazing, and yeah. we see uh, the, uh, the the spirit of God leading this mm -hmm. to say we are not going to stop spread the gospel because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So God has His ways, and as the Bible That's says, right. God's ways are not our ways. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, That's God right. is so powerful that he can make the impossible become possible. Amen. He can open doors that we human beings cannot open. Amen. He can uh, make paths where people cannot walk. This is, this is only God's power and the power of the Holy Spirit, that kind of creativity. Amen. That's right. Yep, I, I'm with you on that. Mm -hmm. Thank God for the Holy Spirit that empowers us every single day and that leads us yeah. and guides us and makes all yeah. these things possible that, that we couldn't have seen the way. Well, thank you so much, John. It was a pleasure to interview you. And we pray that this, this video will be a blessing to many as they watch it. Okay. God bless you. And thank, many thanks to Mennonite Mission Network and also to Showalter Foundation for this donation. It not only brings internet access, but also increase the capacity because we also uh, provided, uh, we're able to purchase a solar backup, which mm. solved the problem of uh, electricity shortage wow. in case they have to uh, or plan a meeting. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, John. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Greetings, friends. This is Sharon Norton from Mennonite Mission Network, and today I'm talking with Dr. Oleksandr Gaichenko from Ukraine. He's the president of the Odessa Theological Seminary, and as we all know, uh, there's war in Ukraine, and that has completely changed life, changed the ministry, changed the school, changed everything. So, Dr. Gaichenko, I'm very happy that you're taking some time um, I know that you have tremendous challenges that you're dealing with, so I'm very thankful that that you're willing to speak with us today about what's happening um, with you and with the the seminary and broadly, more broadly in Ukraine. So, could you just um, describe for us a little bit what your context is yeah. and what your situation and with the seminary, what the situation is for you? Uh, hello, uh, greetings, brothers and sisters from Ukraine. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for this opportunity to share about my experience and uh, what is happening with the theological uh, educational institutions and churches in Ukraine. And uh, uh, at the moment, uh, 
my colleagues and I, we are uh, spread all over Ukraine and some of our faculty members and employees are abroad in Germany, in Moldova. And uh, as a school, we are still working. We work in, uh, as a distributed office, so we meet regularly with my colleagues. And we also continue uh, educational academic sessions with our students uh, through online uh, program. Unfortunately, we, uh, due to the safety reasons, we cannot meet on our campus. Uh, our campus at the moment, which is in Odessa, uh, this is the uh, port and the city on the shores of the Black, uh, Black Sea. And uh, at the moment, the campus is used as the uh, logistics center uh, where we accumulate uh, food products and we, in cooperation with the um, original uh, Baptist Association of Churches, we redistribute these food uh, products uh, to those who are in need through the local pastors and also the volunteers. So you're finding different ways to collaborate locally in Odessa using the building, um, stewarding that resource that you have and um, resources for, for food and shelter and those kinds of things. Um, what, what kinds of, of things are you learning or, or relearning perhaps about mm -hmm. um, collaboration and, and the church in, in times of upheaval and chaos and need? My best lesson which I learned uh, in this situation is uh, what it is to be the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, uh, we uh, realize that we have brothers and sisters, both here in Ukraine, who in different ways open their hearts, their houses, their uh, purses, um, and their arms in order to help each other. So uh, it, it is really amazing in what way, especially for the first, I would say, like three to four weeks, when almost all uh, administrative uh, network of our government, government and our country sort of collapsed. Mm -hmm. Most of the evacuation, provision of food for the refugees, provision of medical care, uh, in a very significant way, churches stepped in and helped the people. Uh, interestingly, uh, two weeks before the war started, I was present uh, uh, at the meeting uh, of the um, regional pastors of the Ukrainian Baptist Union. And at that meeting, uh, we have been discussing that our churches, especially in the Western part of the country, should be ready to receive huge, huge numbers of refugees. Mm -hmm. So we expected uh, that something like that happens. So uh, we actually... I, I learned that the churches, they actually uh, embodied this principle, which, which I knew from the very beginning, this is how to be the body of Christ. And at the same time, I realized that there is a huge number of brothers and sisters abroad who really care for what is happening here. And in different ways, either financially or through given access to humanitarian uh, organizations human uh, and different uh, foundations, they opened opportunities for our churches to sort of channel, channel resources in order to help people who are in need. So uh, this is my greatest lesson from this situation. And another side of this lesson is that as the one who was and still is in Ukraine, I, I felt the pain, the pain of the people whom I met. And it was, it was really challenging. It was challenging physically, emotionally. It was challenging morally, because when you see the suffering of the people whom you knew, used to know. And you cannot just, you know, detach from that and stay away as though nothing is happening. 
So and uh, so that is uh, that way of being the body of Christ means, uh, I think, uh, what Paul meant when he said that we need to feel the measure of the Christ suffering in us. So that is when we consciously take the burden, emotional, and try to make the burden of those who are suffering easier. Mm. Uh, and, and this is probably the hardest, the hardest part, because, you know, uh, you, uh, you have that compassion, but at some point, uh, the measure of your capacity is sort of ex exhausted. And it is very easy to, to be uh, broken at, at that point. And, and it is exactly at that moment when other brothers and sisters, with their support, prayers, with their encouragement, they step in and they sort of unload your burden and you feel refreshment. And again, you know, you, you renew your resources and you, you can continue that way again. So that's, those are different aspects of being the body of Christ. Right. Yeah. So I appreciate that, that, that story um, and that you are receiving the pain and the suffering, even as you um, have your own losses and things to mourn. Um, but yeah, I think, I think in English, we have this term called compassion fatigue. And it is acknowledging that that there's only so much um, capacity we have, but but exactly the the Lord comforts us and the the body of Christ comforts us as well. So, um, Dr. Gaichenko, you've also shared in other places that not all the the body of Christ is functioning in in unity and in unison um, and in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, well, the reality of the body of Christ is that um, this is a community. Well, of course, we know there is an invisible body of Christ, uh, the saints who live before us and who are perfect and they're in front of the throne of God. But at the same time, there is a certain amount of people who confess Christ and who live here and now on, on earth. So, and I learned that this body of Christ is not really perfect uh, in a sense that there are brothers and sisters uh, who see and experience things very much different than we who live in Ukraine uh, do that. So, I'm, I'm talking about my brothers and sisters from Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really painful for me to learn that uh, some of my brothers and sisters, they support uh, the, the government, Russian government, and their initiatives and their, you know, foreign policy and, uh, and their decision to start what they call the special military operation, which is actually aggressive war against Ukraine. And uh, again, uh, uh, with this realization comes the pain that you realize that you have brothers and sisters who confess Christ the same way as you do, <laughs> but at the same time, their allegiance uh, and their, yeah, their allegiance to their country, if I could be wrong, I'm, I'm sorry, is more uh, important for them than their sense of unity with their brothers and sisters who are suffering here and now. So that was, that was a really painful, uh, painful experience on my side. Uh, I still hope and I still pray that uh, these brothers and sisters uh, are enlightened by the power of the Holy Spirit and they realize what are the consequences of uh, of the actions of their government, and they uh, choose to identify with the victims of this war, 
and also take the responsibility for making first steps to reconciliation. And if you had uh, one thing, one request that you could make of those uh, watching this video now, what would it be? Uh, you know, uh, brothers and sisters, we live um, in the times uh, when media set the agenda. And this agenda changes very quickly. And unfortunately, we sort of are led by the, uh, those changes. And I would challenge you not to be a subject of this uh, uh, these instruments of manipulation and change of the agenda. Remember about your brothers and sisters, regardless of what you hear in the news, whether you hear about Ukraine or Burma or some other countries where Indonesia, where people are suffering, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, you, you know, the media can keep silence about Uganda, about uh, other countries, but that suffering, those, you know, hard circumstances, they're still, still there. So take intentional steps to get information, be active in prayer, and try to do what you can in order to attract attention of other people who can change this situation for positive. That's that is my challenge and my uh, my plea to you. Well, we will certainly take that to heart. I just want to thank you again for taking this time, and yeah, we are standing with you. We are praying and sending support and sending love and any kind of networking and collaboration that we can do. We certainly want to do that. So thank you again, and we uh, just pray for God's mercy on Ukraine and on the seminaries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, brothers and sisters uh, from uh, our uh, from the Mennonite uh, network. Thank you very much. May God bless you. We've all experienced COVID. We've all experienced the chaos and the disruption of COVID, um, which you also, like everywhere else, have experienced that. And then there were some crises that that came on top of that. Could you talk a little bit about? Um, the Afghanistan students and and uh, the situation there in the past several months, and how have you responded? Yeah, so LCC has a Middle East scholars program, so we do have um, scholars from Iraq and and Afghanistan, and so after this, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in the fall. Um, most of our Middle East students were in crisis mode, in trauma mode, worried about their families. Um, so they, we were able to really minister to them and provide some counseling and some, some financial support to them, knowing that they were really worried about their families. Um, good note, if you fast forward from the fall of 2021 to the spring of 2022, um, two Afghani women graduated from LCC just weeks after the Taliban had um, banned all women from school in Afghanistan. So that felt really, really, uh, that was a very, very powerful moment for us, um, knowing that we that um, they could get education at LCC and move on with their amazing lives, whatever they'll be doing next. Yeah, yeah, that is, that is uh, quite important and significant. Um, to be able to provide education for people who aren't going to get it now where they come from. So in addition to that, then the war in Ukraine started um, earlier this year. And I know you have quite a few students from Ukraine. Can you talk a little bit about um, your students and what they're experiencing? Yeah, um, LCC has about 700 students in the undergrad program and 180 of those students are from Ukraine. About 56 are from Belarus and about 45 from Russia, all living on campus and experiencing um, the war next door is what we call it, because it is, um, it's both geographically close, but it's also close to Lithuania, both being former Soviet countries. Um, shock, trauma, anger, despair, um, 
students, families were disrupted. They didn't know where they were. Uh, very, very hard decisions about should the families leave whatever town they're in. Some families of our students were harboring refugees. Some were refugees. Um, actually, some of our students' parents came to Klaipeda because their kids were here in university. Um, and just being in class, going to class every day, uh, knowing that Christina is from Mariupol and everything has just been flattened or knowing that um, Sophia's parents are fleeing um, Kakova. And so homework becomes much less important <laughs> than the relationships that we have with our students. And so we had to know when to give grace and when to urge them on in their academic work. Um, students really surprised us. Um, in such in so many so many good ways. Immediately, uh, a group of Ukrainian and Russian students started a, a reg, um, information center in this um, downtown in Klaipeda and provided uh, online information for all the refugees that were moving into Klaipeda. There were more refugees, obviously, in Poland and um, Moldova, but about five about fifty thousand refugees came to Lithuania. Fewer came to Klaipeda, but they, our students really wanted to serve the ones that were here. Um, they then gathered money together. Our students did a fundraising campaign to send insulin to Ukraine. Uh, and they also provided Saturday activities for Ukrainian refugees on campus. And so our students were completing their, their thesis projects, their essays, their end of the year activities that they all do. And on top of that, they were reaching out to Ukrainian uh, guests that came to, to, to Klaipeda. Uh, we were all exhausted all the time because of the um, just daily checking news, weekly and hourly, trying to figure out what is going on, how long will this last, uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, we were very proud of our students for just really gathering up whatever must, you know, steam and strength they had to finish the school year. We had our first in-person graduation in two years. That was lovely. Um, so, yeah, um, donors also stepped up because all banks in Ukraine um, closed. And so our students had no money. Um, so food bank was really um an important part of what LCC did, as well as stipends for you know medical help, uh, tuition stipends. Um, Ukrainians are living in the dormitory this summer because they're not going home. Uh, it really depends on where they're from, but they receive free housing at LCC for the summer, um, trying to help them to cope in any ways that they can. Tonight, um, there's an event, The um, there's a, the new center at LCC called the um, Center for Dialogue and Conflict Transformation. They're hosting a listening circle tonight, and they've done this before, where they just invite any of the Ukrainian students to come and talk and just be there as support for them emotionally. So our students need support, not only academically and financially, um, but also socially and emotionally with what's going on. Um, in their home countries. But again, they've been quite strong and we've been quite proud of uh, their response. But yeah, on campus, a lot of us are quite exhausted, <laughs> but yeah. we, want to, we want to remain strong and we want to, to um, show them that our, that our faith really does mean something at a time like this and we can turn and help each other. Yeah, wow. That's incredible. All the things um, that, that students are doing just out of their own initiative on top of all of the demands of the academics, uh, yeah, it, it's beautiful to see that that resilience, that hope, that drives people. I do sometimes wonder about the longevity. You know, as it, it seems that this will be more of a protracted um, war situation. So you you had mentioned the Center for Dialogue and Conflict Transformation. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the initiatives of that center um, in regards to migration? Uh, yeah, two things actually. A year ago, we um, the the center opened or planned a conference, a peace conference, the first peace conference here at LCC, and they planned it for March of 2022. 
had no idea <laughs> that the war would happen in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so um, our students had a lot of voice in that conference and were able to um, really dialogue about what does this mean politically and socially um, for them. This summer, the, the center has been active in uh, a refugee camp here in Lithuania. If you're following the news at all, you, you understand that refugees came from the Middle East and were told they could get to Europe, the European Union, through Belarus. Right. And then Belarus said, uh, no, not here. And they pushed them through Belarus to Lithuania and they don't have legal status here in Lithuania. So they're stuck about um, uh, several hundred people are Middle Easterners are stuck in a refugee camp in Lithuania. And so our center, um, uh, some faculty and staff and students from LCC spent a week there um, just trying to support what is happening there at the refugee center and um, giving them a chance to understand the trauma that they're in and trying to give them coping skills um, and ways to stay resilient there as well. So another population group that um, we've reached out to. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. There's so many different things going on, so many different crises to respond to. Um, you know, some of it is very unique to Lithuania and some of it, you know, other countries are experiencing as well. There's two stories that I will just add I don't, um, of hope. One is that um, my, there's a thesis student that I'm working with. He's going to complete his master's degree in TESOL. Um, he is uh, Iraqi. He's Yazidi and he's doing his, he's teaching in the refugee camps there and also doing his practicum in the, uh, the Kurdish refugee camps in Iraq. And he's just passionate about teaching English and about giving education to young people there. The second one is that um, a young student from Ukraine is, has just really become so passionate about teaching and going back to Ukraine to teach knowing that on top of not just knowing how to teach young people in a public school, she will have to go back armed with the knowledge and the skills to do trauma counseling in any school that she's in, in Ukraine. And so she says, now I not only want to teach, I also want to do trauma counseling. And um, this young woman is going to be a, a powerful and uh, force for positive that's uh, in Ukraine when, when she does go back and, and teach there. So I thought I'd add those two stories. Yeah, thank you so much. Those those are good to hear. It's good to hear, you know, about actual people. Sometimes the news and everything is just so anonymous, but it's good to hear about actual people and how they're deciding to to face the challenges in front of them. Is there anything, any kind of a challenge or a request that you would like to leave our viewers with? We ask for prayers for LCC International University, both for wisdom in all the projects that uh, the university is involved in and also prayers for our students that they would have the resiliency to continue their studies so that they can be real change makers um, in the world. There are many ways to get involved with LCC. Um, not only is it a, a place that that needs donations um, of money, but also of time and expertise. So as you know, people who have time and expertise um, for teaching at university uh, please contact us. We'd love to to hear from you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robin, for sharing with us. Uh, we appreciate it greatly. Yeah, thank you for having me. Fernando and Rebecca, we said this on coordinator. Fernando and Rebecca, you are coordinators of CETA, the Community of Anabaptist Theological Institution. Can you explain briefly why CETA was formed and what are some of the achievements and aspirations? Uh, well, CETA was formed in November 2016 in Guatemala in the installations of the Latin American Anabaptist Seminary, SEMIA. There we had a gathering of different directors of institutions where we had a dialogue that was uh, very interesting on how we could be united. And together we dreamed of a vision of um, what to do together. And so this network was formed uh, that we call CITA, and it has a vision to be a network of Anabaptist seminaries for biblical, theological, and pastoral formation for Christian mission in the world. 
and with the mission of what to do together that is to provide a diversity of alternatives for continuous biblical theological formation in Spanish for the people of God. There are Anabaptist Hispanic churches in the United States, um, and also we can come closer together with them. So there's a diversity as much in the United States as in Latin America and now also Spain that we are cooperating together for better uh, theological education in uh, where, where we are working. So there's some special strategies with which we're working. We develop and promote the Anabaptist Digital Library. That's something that we're trying to motivate all the teachers and uh, writers that they can be preparing their uh, their writing and place them in the digital library in order to enrich the library with uh, new new discoveries, uh, theological studies that can serve in the mission of the church. Also, there's a, a system of um, uh, training through technology and communication for professors and students. This is very important to be able to um, bring ourselves up to date with techniques. And uh, really, this change uh, since the pandemic, we all had to transport our education online. And uh, so there was a need to prepare ourselves and began to encourage the professors and students to be able to utilize the uh, uh, communication and to make use of them to be able to take advantage of this opportunity to operate online. And also another thing we do is uh, programs of dissemination and promotion of online education. We motivate through different uh, ways and social networks so that students can be motivated and participate in online education. And with all this, we need the cooperation of the institutions and the development of new projects Projects, and we motivate the different institutions so that they can have spaces of dialogue and uh, also to reach agreement for mutual cooperation. So this is what we're doing now in uh, CETA. Yes, the students have uh, had a lot of enthusiasm in online education and given the opportunity to be able to come closer together, to be able to create intercultural spaces, to be able to reach uh, places that we could, well, at least imagine, where people can have access in an easier way uh, for theological education. So we're going to name the different uh, members that uh, uh, make up CETA, Latin American Anabaptist Seminary, Semilla, Center for Anabaptist Studies, CEA, Semilla, Mexico, also Hispanic Anabaptist Biblical Seminary, and Anabaptist Biblical Institute IBA of the United States, and the Biblical Theological Center of the Mennonite Brethren, uh, CBT as we know it, in Cali, Colombia. And also in this network, we have the Mennonite Biblical Seminary of Colombia, and also the Anabaptist Digital Library that uh, has been uh, collecting various work from across Latin America. And we also have the privilege and the honor now of uh, having with us uh, the Cononia Theological Center of Spain, uh, where our brother Dionisio Bailer is, Antonio Gonzalez, and others there who are promoting the theological uh, education among Hispanic people, also in Latin America, as well, their own piece. And recently, we've added ALMA, which is the Anabaptist Missional Leadership Academy of uh, the uh, Hispanic Mennonite Church in the United States. So we have a lot of um, energy to receive them and to be together promoting education online. Thank you. And I understand that CETA began before the pandemic, but the pandemic really increased this interest in studying online. And uh, so we see that you are prepared with CETA and uh, with this enthusiasm for collaborating together among the institutions in order to provide more opportunities 
for students and, well, the whole Hispanic-speaking uh, world. But in addition to the programs of biblical theological studies, how, uh, how, how have you managed to support uh, Spanish-speaking people in many different countries in preparing themselves to manage the crisis of the pandemic and uh, to support other people as well. I know you did a lot of creative things. Uh, yes, it's, it's very interesting that um, this, uh, this gathering uh, together was in 2016. And so certainly we didn't know that there was going to be a pandemic. And uh, really, we didn't imagine all that was coming. Nevertheless, the institutions were beginning to do their processes for virtual education. And so our task was to encourage and to motivate the seminaries in uh, placing their programs on a virtual platform. And uh, for some, it was maybe a little difficult and uh, between the struggle of yes and no, because, well, we want to be present with each other. But then with the pandemic, um, now it wasn't an option. Now it, there wasn't the possibility, but it was uh, obligation for the seminaries to put uh, their all their programs um, online. And so those that uh, didn't have much experience began to learn and began, and we tried to motivate and to uh, give different ways and manners to be able to encourage them in putting their work online. It was very interesting to see the struggles because uh, even though they wanted to, well, we weren't really prepared in various institutions in order to take up online education. But this obligated us to learn as much the institutions as uh, also with the administrative aspect and of course many students also but also professors and so it was like a, a kind of kind of experience that resulted in a lot of work because for one thing to learn the new technologies the pedagogical process and at the same time how to do it so that all of the students could learn uh, through online education in biblical theological education. So it was very interesting. Um, now today there are more possibilities. Uh, there's more experience uh, than at the beginning, as much the students as professors and administrators. So this has given a great opening. Uh, now in Latin America, we have biblical theological education online. We had the opportunity to also accompany people, many people who maybe called us to say, oh, I want to study, but how do I do this? Um, I don't have a computer or I don't have this or I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to enter into Zoom. Um, all these small details that now seem to be the most simple in their own moment, it was very difficult. And uh, so we oriented uh, people with simple details, like in, in WhatsApp, through WhatsApp, let's send messages and uh, let's uh, place a class there in WhatsApp so that people can be preparing. And uh, so we did this part of motivating as much with the students, uh, many students, and also orienting them, orienting professors, uh, encouraging the institutions uh, so that uh, we can be creative in the use of technology, because really technology is a tool that has come to stay. And it's definitely something that when the pandemic passes and uh, we're not going back to how things were before, no, but rather we're using technology that is something that is creating a change in our minds because it's a change um, that a change of models in education. And uh, now education is a, a community model because it is uh, coming and going that uh, it's not the professor teaching the students, but now the students are working together in a community way in order to learn and to teach. And so everything is changing and uh, we're not going backwards. So uh, the pandemic can end, more pandemics can come, but education changes. And now in this way of learning that is so community minded, it uh, permits us to listen to each other, to encourage each other so that participation be for, for everyone. There's really no limit of space and time because really, really we can reach people 
with the uh, simplest level of education and they can reach it with a simple WhatsApp. They can access education. This has been a, a very important thing that has motivated all generations. And this is a challenge that we have now with the new generations. Yeah, certainly, and one of the important things that Rebecca said and in response to your question is exactly um, this last question you asked, is the virtual questions created dialogues uh, as much in WhatsApp as in Zoom for various subjects in different countries um, uh, about issues of uh, mental health and uh, uh, logotherapy and psychology. And so this has created dialogues that have um, given like a, a, a space of peace, a space of uh, relaxation. And this has been a big blessing for many brothers and sisters. And so, uh, yes, it has been a virtual space uh, where we're far away and yet at the same time close together. We've created a community, a concept of uh, healing through the courses, through the dialogues, through uh, the WhatsApp messages and requesting prayer or saying I can't be in class. So there's there's something there that continues to motivate and continuing forward. So it's been uh, a holistic question here uh, with virtuality. And so, yes, um, virtual education is very important in a positive way. And it's, it's, it's community uh, focused and that gives a lot of results, not just now, but also in the future. But if we see it as a personal individualistic thing, well, then it's going to result in the contrary. And uh, But we want this space to grow together. Um, so we're grateful to God who gives us this opportunity to part of this change, uh, impulsing this educational innovation that permits us to reach so many brothers and sisters in what area, whatever area, not just Latin America. But now we've uh, uh, jumped over the ocean to Spain and whatever place where there are people who speak Spanish that they can have access to online education with all of this uh, educational diversity that the seminaries present uh, that are also strong. It's um, not that the seminaries have everything all solved. Each seminary, each institution is having their own process, their difficulties, their obstacles, but they're they're struggling in order to overcome them. And we we dream to have an education that's more advanced in which uh, we can uh, reach the new generations, and that permits us to see new professors. Uh, we want young professors. Uh, many of us now aren't so young anymore, and we'd like to see these new generations um, lifted up and to say, uh, God, here I am, here I am to continue uh, serving in the educational area in uh, teaching. And the pastoral uh, work also, the pastoral ecclesial needs. This is why the theological institutions are here to form new leadership in these communities. Uh, yes, thank you very much. It's a good example of collaboration. And I like a lot what you said about it being a community process, not an individualistic process. And we've seen this, we've seen it with CETA as much with the city study program for biblical theological education, but also the initiatives to have a, a group of people from different countries studying together. Uh, studying grief, how to console each other together in difficult times. And so it's uh, really a community process that's very important. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca and Fernando, for being with us today. And many blessings to you with this uh, great challenge that is uh, Sita.